And we're back, part two, with the incredible celebrity lyricist oh. and yeah. the uh, daughter of the famous jazz writer, Leonard Feather. This is part two with Lorraine Feather. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, Rob. Hi, everybody, again. So during the prep to part two here, um, we were talking, just kind of chit-chatting a little bit about her dad. And I, as a backstory of my own personal life, impacted by him, um, with his writing first because when i was in high school i went to lincoln high in denver colorado i had a fantastic uh, band director there jack frederickson and my girlfriend's parents actually um, knew that i was a musician because i met my girlfriend who was a uh, trombone player in the jazz band and you know about trombone players <laughs> <laughs> I've heard many trombone player jokes. Well, there's a lot of them, but she was actually quite the character. And her parents had already found out that, okay, so our daughter is dating a musician that's already playing a lot of gigs. And yeah. what would be a good birthday present for him? And they bought me your dad's incredible book for my birthday, the Encyclopedia I mean, of Jazz. Yeah. Aww. And so when I turned um, 17 years old, I was given this huge book with a red cover on it. And it said, Leonard Feather Encyclopedia of Jazz. And I had no idea who your dad was at that point, but I looked at it and it was like, everybody, like everybody, everybody, everybody was in there. And it was actually an encyclopedia really of that era, the most definitive book on jazz that had ever been written uh up to that point and you as his daughter got to you know be i'm sure uh at dinner tables and discussions with him as he was doing these interviews and putting it together what was that like well what i what i remember was was the dinner table being used as a sort of desk because my dad and ira gitler were contacting musicians all over the world and wow. this was before the days of the internet. Right. And I can't imagine how difficult it must have been to reach these people who were are, um, all over the place. And in some case, they didn't want to respond or they couldn't or who knows what. And it was just a, a mass of papers spread out on this long black table that they kept for many, many years. It was our dining table. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, that, that was quite a feat. But, you know, my dad was in a way although he was known as a, a jazz critic or journalist more successful as a songwriter than he ever was as a journalist he he had in those days before streaming more income from writing songs for bb king ella fitzgerald dinah washington all of these people uh he was just he was incredibly prolific and driven my father was but wow. he was mostly known for, for his uh, his reviews. Well, and, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I knew about him as the writer, of course, first. And then years later, in the early 90s, I got invited to participate in a thing at Colorado University at Boulder called the Conference on World Affairs. Oh, yeah. Don Grusin used to go to that. And my dad. Don, yeah, Don and Dave were the official music dudes. And I was the young upstart guy that had, you know, I was the Grammy guy from Lincoln High. You know, <laughs> I'd gone out to LA and my album was on all the stations. And so I got invited by a saxophonist, uh, Spike Robinson and his girlfriend, Betty Weems, to be on this conference. And Betty one of the Weems, things- yeah, 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 she was Spike Robinson's girlfriend, but she also funded that conference mm -hmm. and they had this huge mansion just right by the college so her house was kind of the unofficial jam house she had a grand piano three stories boulder creek ran through the yard there were deer out there and she on spike robinson's recommendation said oh well rob mullins would be a great participant in our conference let's invite him and it was a hundred people only, invitation only, uh, to this thing. It was very prestigious. Like Roger Ebert was the movie guy. And right. um, 
and you know all of these different people but your dad was the kind of the center piece of that your dad dave grusen and don grusen and so all of a sudden one day i arrive at this thing and you have orientation and you're looking at your brochure and you're saying oh i didn't know i was going to have to do debates and they yeah, said they, wanted, they, they take, wanted you to talk about subjects that were not necessarily in your bailiwick yeah right there was uh, stuff that's not I, I, I was i was always scared to go because of that i was terrified because my first debate was i had to debate roger ebert and roger at this time was riding the wave of not only the chicago sun times but his very popular tv show with gene siskel and so the topic they yeah. gave me was garbage as national security and i read this thing and i looked in there and i'm like i am so screwed like i have no you know i am so screwed i am not gonna have a chance against this famous wordsmith and roger did crucify me in a public room on video but, <laughs> but and for him he didn't even you know he was probably just like reading some brochure of something else while he did it. You know, he was- It was, it was nothing to him. <laughs> no, it was nothing to him. And, but um, anyway- Well, you got through it though. I got through it, but then I was excited because people are like, that guy there is Leonard Feather. Ah. I'm like, oh my God, I'm looking through the list of the things and it was Leonard Feather, the, you know, world famous critic and he had already written an art of uh, a review for the for a, a gig that I did in Westwood, and it was published in the LA Times. And my dad, being a newspaper guy, once his son was written up, and thankfully your dad was very nice to me. Yeah. You know, because I was warned by the record company not to play any synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, and so your dad's review actually um, has led to a lot of work for me for my straight ahead jazz trio, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, I'm grateful to him for, for that. And then we actually did perform some of his songs that you were talking about at this conference. And, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I'm the young guy. I'm full of myself. What is this stupid music we have to play? But people, that are coming into our business a lot of times they don't realize that the money from publishing is still one of the ways that you can really survive right have you found that to be true uh, for yourself? yes uh, yes but um but when when my dad was alive it was different what streaming has wrought of course has been the death knell to many people i've been able to that's that's how i'm able to to scrape by is uh is through through songs but it's uh it's gotten terrible my, my father would be just horrified if he saw some of these statements i won't even look because the fact is that there's still in income that that arrives and I, i'm grateful for it but there are certain portions of it that i just, I just can't handle like uh -huh. i want to hear someone go oh my god do you realize that this song of yours got twenty three thousand plays and you only made 50 says it's like, just don't don't read it to me. You know, I, I don't want to know because it's too upsetting. It's very upsetting. I, I had a statement in 2011 and my biggest song was one that uh, ironically had a lot of opposition from my family and my fans because I was using this modern thing called the drum machine. <laughs> and I was told by many people, especially my mother, who was, you know, a jazz aficionado and a church pianist, that it sounded worse than the pre-programmed background cassettes for the Con Theater organ. <laughs> she said, this is worse than that stuff that they make you play at the mall to sell those crappy organs. Yeah, thanks, Mom. And um, I was like, okay, well, now it's Grammy nominated. So um, I don't know what you got to say about that, but in the early days of that song, it was called Making Love. There was a lot of money coming in. And then in 2011, I got a statement where I had 
four, I'll never forget this, 491,000 plays. And I got $51 for a half million plays. Yeah, well, the, the, the famous one was Pharrell Williams' Happy, which is one of the biggest hits ever in yeah. the world. And it got whatever, 80 quadrillion plays, and he made 2,300 bucks a day. That's the kind of thing, like, don't tell me another story like that because it's, it really upsets me. And yet somehow or other, the, um, there is, there's still some money to be made in, in publishing, but it's just... Um, it's not what it used to be, that's for sure. Anyway, well, my dad wrote, sorry. No, 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 tell me. I want to know about his songs that he wrote. Of, loads of blues tunes. How Blue Can You Get for B.B. King. It's a big hit okay. brand. How Blue Can You Get? Yeah, he won um, a BMI award, which is basically just records sold. Uh -huh. And I, I accepted for him because he, it was on uh, Primitive Radio Gods was the name of, was it the group or the album? I guess that was the group. It was a, tr a rock track. And it was like, I've been down hard at baby ever since the day we met, ever since the day we met. He just used it as a loop. And um, so there was there there was some money that, that came in from that. And every now and then there's a license fee. And um, I just thank, uh, thank God that there are people out there fighting to make it more fair for us. Yeah, but, I, um, you know, in a, in a way it's like, uh, and it's hard to stay positive about it because there's so much of a game over man kind of feeling when I talk to most of my peers, because, you know, in combination with all that in 2008, I was making that in 2007, I made $97,000 in royalties. Now, the reason that I made that much and I can't sing and I didn't write any lyrics was because of these things that you were mentioning, like the sync licensing, you know? Yeah. And there was a company in Japan using my music for the weather on national television in Japan. And that song was called No Secrets. It was from my Tokyo Nights album. But when the financial crash hit, one of the first things that those companies did when it all fell apart was they started canceling all those licenses. Yeah. So I went from 97 grand a year to three. So in 2008, my income was short $94,000. And by the way, folks, or those of you that are, you know, watching and young songwriters, you don't get a message to your email that says, we are now canceling all of your money and all of your life. You don't find out because the BMI statements don't come out for another three months or even in, a lot of cases, six months or nine months later. So I just saw this nosedive happening in my statements with no one saying, by the way, you're completely screwed now until the end of your life. And um, it's quite a challenging thing to just kind of come to grips with that. Because I'm like that, just like you are. It's like, please don't read me anymore. Please don't tell me anymore bad news because i've already you know got enough bad news going on today and uh it's very a very hard business to survive in but during the heyday when your dad was doing this stuff now i hung out with him you know we would hang out at these parties but he never told me that he didn't say oh yeah i wrote for bb king like uh, that would have instantly shot him into the jazz celebrity stratosphere and even further than being such a great writer because i didn't know that he was doing that yeah aretha franklin sang his evil gal blues in dinah washington and um his one of his most famous non-blues things was called i remember bird that was recorded by oliver nelson it's oh really, wow oh it is a, just a fantastic uh performance of it out there i, I forget if, what live event it was but it was, it was really something <laughs> Yeah, Oliver Nelson was one of my early mentors when the Denver Public Schools Citywide Jazz Band went to this Mobile, Alabama Jazz Festival. And the two things I remember about that festival was, uh, number one, our jazz band directors knew that it was a dry city in a dry county. Yeah. So they all put like fifths of Jack Daniels and, Sc and Scotch into their luggage. Uh -huh. And we arrived in Mobile 
And the security guys at the airport are like, wow, that suitcase really smells funny. And all of their booze had exploded. Oh, shit. Oh, all, over, <laughs> all, all over their clothes and their suitcases. And then we had to stay in the airport while maybe our jazz directors were going to be um, going to jail for smuggling. And we're like, you know, it's me and Diane Reeves was the singer and um, uh, a couple other, uh, <clears throat> oh gosh, uh, a couple of horn players that did well. And then, you know, luckily we got into the thing and and Clark Terry, Irby Green and Oliver Nelson were the mentors. And Oliver came up to me and showed me the voicings to Stolen Moments. Ah. And I was like, cha-ching, man. And I was only 16 when this happened. And I'm thinking, how could I possibly go wrong? Because the DPS put me in, uh, you know, this amazing freaking thing. But your dad, having worked and known so many people doing all this with no email, no internet. I mean, you're imagining trying to reach freaking <clears throat> Miles Davis in Stockholm, exactly. what the long distance telephone call would have cost. Yeah. And Miles wasn't going to come to the phone anyway. <laughs> you know, most of, most of the time. But anyway, segueing on, um, my own particular life that you wrote about, uh, Tony, who was, you know, I wasn't that close to Tony, but I knew um, Steve Reed, the percussionist for the Rippingtons, yeah. also was from Colorado. He was from Georgetown. Yeah. And Russ Freeman and I kind of hit around the same time uh, on radio. So I met Russ and Russ went on to far outsell and outpace me and just like do super great while uh, I battled with my crisis between straight ahead jazz and contemporary jazz and all that. But Tony could come into the studio and just play these insane things like, he, you know, he would be playing to a click. And they would record his whole kit, but then they would just use the kick and the uh, cymbals. Uh -huh. And then Russ would have these like Lindrum samples. Uh -huh. And then the sampled kick and the uh, sampled snare would be on there. But a lot of times he would use Tony's toms because Tony really knew how to tune his yeah. kit, you know. I, yeah. I've forgotten about that, but now that now that you mention it, I I I I knew about it. Um, Tony, when we were first married, we lived in La Crescenta, California. We had lived in this tiny, teeny little house, and we converted the garage to his practice space on one side and my writing space on the other. And he had the the, the this tiny little practice room. That's where we also created some of our first tunes together. When I began writing albums uh -huh. um, but he had the egg crates on the wall and stuff and I was was writing for cartoons at the time and my little story about Tony is that he came in one day and he was uh drenched with sweat it, Tony was really skinny is a really skinny guy I have right. eight through our whole marriage and he came in and and he was mopping his face and he was absolutely his clothing was completely wet from his exertion of practicing the drums for hours right and I, he said, oh, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm just having a little trouble with this, this lyric for this cartoon. And Tony, it's very sarcastic, went, oh, gee, honey, did you have to think really hard? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it is a funny thing, too, because the, the artistic fields have every aspect of human life and human activity and human exertion included in them. And I had a best friend for years that helped me going into the financial crash. And he's um, now he does the digital marketing and branding for the astrophysicist Michu Kaku, right? And so he, uh, his, his name is uh, Robert and he's always been a really brilliant guy. And he took me to so many sushi dinners and listen, we, we had all these favorite albums that jazz and otherwise were like, Oh, you like this? Oh yeah, I like that. You like this? I like that. And we became really good friends over the music. 
And he at one point was managing five big accounts doing branding and consulting in like 2003, he was making, I don't know, 20 to 50 grand on each account. And he was doing it all over the internet while I would chauffeur him around in a Mercedes that he bought me. <laughs> Cause he didn't like, he's like you, he's like, yeah, I don't really want to drive. I'm not into cars, I'm into traffic. Rob, you know, we'll get, we'll get you an E350, I'll co-sign, one day it'll be yours. But in the meantime, take me to the Ikea up in Burbank and cancel all your students. Cause I'll give you a thousand dollars to drive me to Ikea. Ikea, yeah. And I'm like, oh yeah, man, we're going to go furniture shopping. But his point, yeah, I spent time in that Ikea. <laughs> his point was sometimes after he would do these calls and I just have to like drive him or sit in traffic and he would be on these phone calls just for hours and hours and hours. Oh no, this, that, no, sell this, buy that. No, fire this guy, hire that person. No, we're expanding. Yeah. And the point that relates back to, you know, what Tony's funny comment was about thinking really hard, hard is Robert would hit a point where he'd just say, I just can't think anymore. I'm just too exhausted. Yeah. And all he had done really was just sit in the car all day. But mental work and using your brain and thinking yeah. and working back, like, do you find in your compositional process that sometimes something will kind of just rush out of you and it's all completed and other days you'll just struggle and struggle to complete something um well i i do have what i, I call garbage days where i just work on something or, or if i'm working in person with with eddie we we sometimes will go through a day and we'll go like yeah we don't like anything that we did but uh -huh. inevitably the next day is great it doesn't happen it doesn't usually happen for multiple days, but um, what goes on with me is I just apply myself to the tune, the lyric. I think about what I'm gonna do, I play around. Usually I have some kind of template or groove in the background if it's an up-tempo tune uh -huh. just to, get, to get the phrasing and, and the pocket and all that. Um, and I'll do a certain amount of work in my, my now apartment on my couch and then I'll go out for a walk and always, and this used to happen to me when I was living on Orcas Island with Tony Ells, when I go down walk to the cove, as soon as I started on my walk, this, the lyric would begin rearranging itself in my head. Like I'd find internal rhymes and I'd think of some kind of idea that I thought was funny or insightful for the middle of the tune or something. Right, right. Just like it, it all just begins to bubble up and now, it, like when I was writing my own particular life, I would go out for my walk and it, it was instantaneous. I even just going down the front steps of this Victorian house where I, I live, um, before I even hit the, the pavement, it would start to happen. So it's it's something I'm I'm used to, but it, it, it is work in its own way. That I, I always like to have a couch nearby when I'm working oh. at the desk because I, I often have to take a snooze after I've been working on it for a while. It's just, it, it's just the way it is. Well, the, um, the advent of modern technology has been overall, in my opinion, uh, on the downside of it, it's destroyed humanity. And on the upside of it, it's made it, I think, easier for composers because what I started finding out similarly as I'd be in the studio and I'd just be like, oh my God. And I've worked a lot. I've always had like a bedroom kind of studio. Yeah. And when they when they came up with this thing of like, oh now you can have a studio in your bedroom. I had one since I was like eleven. <laughs> right. I had a snare drum and I had a cassette player and I had a, a turntable. But I would find that Similarly to you, I would get out of the studio. I'm going to go for a drive. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, 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 boom. And my brain is rearranging and it's clicking and all this. So yeah. I used to carry before the cell phones, I would carry these little um, uh, mini cassette recorders made by Memorex. And I'd have this little thing and I go, oh my God, that's going to be the beginning of the bridge. And I click it on and my yeah. horrible grovelly terrible unmelodic voice I would sing the rhythm or the groove or whatever mm -hmm. I, 
I did an entire Ronnie Laws album that way with Ronnie singing me these things when he was just in the shower getting ready to go to Indigo Ranch for the session. You know, he would call me up and he'd say, yeah, Mullins, okay, write this down. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, but I would have to find a way to remember that or record it. And I started recording some of Ronnie's calls and he would just say, okay, this is the groove. And he would do it. And then kind of like a Bobby McFerrin beatboxy kind of thing, he would just yeah. groove it. And then he'd say, okay, this is going to be the melody. But it did and I'd be like, got it, boss. And I'd say, by the time you get to the studio today, I want you to have all the chord changes to that. And that's how it happens, you know? So sometimes for composers, I think it can be, you know, you might wait two months for that one moment where the inspiration taps you on the shoulder at three in the morning and says, Hi, I'm ready to be born. I'm ready. Right, you know. <laughs> yeah, <it's like laughs> but, the portal opens. Um, but, but your newest album, but before we run out of time, and then, like I said before, I hope I can come to New York and just take you out to coffee one day. And oh, sure. I hope it won't be creepy if I record the whole thing. <laughs> because, you know. Not if I, I'm warned. Not if you're awake, right? <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> but. Yeah. But um, there's, I, I'm going to have to pull this up here because the artwork, I mean, uh, I've got these fantastic pictures of you and you look absolutely stunning, by the way. You're unbelievable. Very stylish. Um, we didn't even get to the Tom Waits stuff. Maybe we'll do that in another interview. But I'm, I'm intrigued with the album cover, the pre-release cover to your new album, The Green World. Ah, uh, yeah. And for people that... Um, you know, are new to Lorraine's music. It actually is one of those things where you can't be a modern internet user and understand Lorraine's music. It's not like if you bump into Lorraine on Facebook, um, just as her friend, I'm going to say, why don't you as a human person that's terrified of leaving Facebook because somebody might post a picture of a sandwich that you could actually Google her name and you could actually read about some of her songs. You could actually listen to some of her music without Spotify telling you what you're supposed to listen to. Like, where's that curiosity and where is that spirit of discovery that people like me, I was always like, wow, there's this new artist. Great. And I would study everything. I'd read the liner notes, I'd the cover. Now this thing about Spotify recommends that you Put this on while you're having oh, yeah. a spa. And I'm like, I don't even own a spa. Yeah, well, if you want to buy right. a spa, mm -hmm. you have a spa yeah. for sale. And I'd say, no, I don't really like a spa. Then the next thing that pops up is, well, we see that you're not a spa person. So instead of a spa, how about horseback riding? And I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> you know, so, but Lorraine's artwork is as unique and interesting as she is as a person in the new album. The Green World has an intriguing cover that not having heard the music yet, but tell us just about this artist that you picked that's doing your art. It's um, he, he's retired now, uh, but his okay. name is Michael Ticino. And Michael Ticino. Is he yeah, from New yes, York too? Yes, C-I-N-O. He lives in Pennsylvania. Okay. He, uh, my, my husband, Tony, recommended him to me because I wanted a cover for an album I did called Tales of the Unusual. I wanted it to be me, but in a kind of a weird setting. And I, I approached Michael and he put me in an arbor. I'm sitting there with a big hat on as if telling the story to my dog, Sterling. But Sterling okay. was in on Orcas Island. We took a picture of him looking up toward a biscuit that we can't see. And then I was in Santa Monica in front of white paper. And then he put um, this arboretum in back of me we did several albums together and then he retired, but he said that uh, I could use anything of his that I, I wanted. So, wow. so um, out of his whole body of work. Well, maybe I should say that it sounds kind of strange, but yeah, he said, if you want to use any of any of my work. So I, I, I chose this little girl for my own particular life that the title of that is Dolly. And it's this little girl 
kind of strange looking in old fashioned clothes with topiary around her. And then for the green world, it's uh, giraffes in a labyrinth is the best way I can describe it. <laughs> I'm looking um, at it right now. And I mean, it's just, it's kind of like for the average person uh, that, you know, really doesn't know much about you or whatever, or me is just like, if I had never met you, I would look at this thing and it's kind of like if Nat Geo met Jurassic Park in Africa. Oh, I, I had something that I wanted to mention. He said, I have a little fan page. When I say little, I mean, there are just a few hundred people on it. Uh -huh. It's called uh, Lorraine Feather Should Be a Household Name. It, it, this woman, um, Episcopalian priest lady and her wife came up with it because I had a song called Household Name. Oh. One of my albums about celebrity a long time ago. And they put together this website for me. And if anybody would care to, to look at it, I do like little previews of me rehearsing some of the song, bits of the songs. Oh, wow. Be recording, just kind of like under my breath before I'm warmed up, you know, with the demo. Beautiful, beautiful. Like wow, and they just did that because they're your fans, right? They did that because they're my fans and they're just wonderful people. I, I, met, I met them once in person. They came to see me and Stephanie and uh, they live in Peekskill and they have, mal they have a Malamute and they're uh they're they're really awesome yeah they, they just did it to be just because um wow but uh yeah facebook is nice because i keep in touch with people i knew from grade school and uh, radio people who were as i said mostly just fantastic right and, uh, you know musicians i've known over the years like you yeah that was actually how um how there was a connection there uh, because I think we both are part of Scott Yanow's uh, Facebook group called the Jazz World. And then um, plus yeah. I see you come up as part of the Grammys voting member, uh, yeah. you know, those pages every year, uh, Lorraine and I vote on the Grammys. And um, boy, that's a whole nother discussion. Oh yeah, that would have to be parts three, four and five. Yeah, three, four and five, but um, before we run out of time, I just, uh, I, I'm happy that that's one of those things about good things about the internet, because, um, you know, and I'll say this in maybe, a, you know, ha glass half full, half empty way. There's no need for me to ever go to a high school reunion because everybody came to me. Like mm -hmm. once I started being a well-known jazz guy, which we know by now is like, you certainly wouldn't want to try and do that for profit <laughs> you know in 2023 yeah. but all these people out of the out of high school and junior high and um you know radio folks and uh you know people that i met on the bruce willis tours and all this it's a way that they all have access to you for better or for worse yeah and in in this case i'm really thrilled because i had just always known of you uh, I had never known you and I figured, I guess I figured wrong because I just thought you were from your pictures and stuff. You were like decades younger than you are. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know that she would be, you know, a great guest or not because she was probably not even born when Leonard was like doing a lot of this stuff. And then today earlier, when you told me her age, I was like, Oh my God, if you ever needed to just get out and make a lot of money, just go do some commercials, you know, for whatever, skin the, cream. The ARP, or, the ARP singer songwriter issue. The ARP singer songwriter. <laughs> Somebody's already mentioned this to you. No. <laughs> but, but you thought it up because you're that bright. Now, um, when, is, uh, when is your new album, The Green World, going to be released? Well, I would say, uh, I hope in the spring of next year. Okay. Yeah. So you and Eddie are still spring, kind of working on it now. Anyway. You're, are you still working on it with Eddie now or is it in the can? Yeah, I'm working on it with Eddie and, um, and with Russell. And um, I have new other lyrics. I have the lyrics for at least half of it. So I, I just go through stages. First of all, I learn the songs, I practice them. 
um, I'm going to go out to LA and, and do some recording, but it, it's just, a, it's a piece at a time because I'm doing it all on my own. You know? Well, it's, you know, it's just so refreshing to know some, you know, get a little glimpse into the person that you are the, the behind all of the legacies and stuff. I mean, we didn't even really talk about the difficulties of uh, childhood celebrity and all the traveling and all of that stuff, but you're a warm, uh, sincere, genuine, genius, loving, beautiful oh, man. person, man. I just thought I'm so thrilled. I'm so that, glad that we got a chance to do this. It's really been it's been interesting. I could we could go on and on. Well, we are going to in the future, and um, right now I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna call it here. So, folks, uh, Lorraine Feather, lyricist, jazz, and multi genre composer. Um, a daughter of the famous jazz writer, Leonard Feather, the most important jazz writer of the 20th century. I can make that claim because Leonard was life-changing for me and thousands and now millions of other musicians. And uh, it's an honor to know you and meet you. And um, Likewise, I'll look Ron. forward to hearing your, your next album. So that's going to do it, right. everybody, for Bye, another everyone. episode of the Planet Mullins podcast. Thank you, Lorraine. Thanks.